Last week on Mondays with Mo, we talked quite a bit about Neo, one of many games that has been sitting in my backlog that I finally dove my way into. I talked quite a bit about wrapping up some games as well, and I figured it was finally time to dive into the two massive expansions for The Witcher 3. If you don't know me, I'm a huge Witcher 3 fanatic. It's one of my all-time favorite RPGs. I think it is, without a doubt, one of the greatest RPGs ever made. It is an incredible piece of world design, storytelling, character development. It's just one of those games you really shouldn't miss out on. The combat may not be perfect, but I think it's good enough, and there's a lot of things I like about it. And as a whole, the experience The Witcher 3 offers is above... Well, it's above a lot of things. It's just really good. So I've been holding off on those DLCs. I've owned the expansion pass on PC specifically for quite some time now, even though I played my main Witcher 3 story over on the Xbox. So I was kind of torn as to what I wanted to do. Do I buy the expansion pass on Xbox? Or do I go to PC? I was fortunate enough to find out that you can actually dive into Heart of Stone or Blood and Wine, and the game will give you a character that is leveled and that has sort of all of the side quest stuff still available to be unlocked once again. So I was like, well, that's perfect. I'll just start off with like a fresh Geralt and I'll kind of like tweak him a little bit, get his hair cut and stuff like that. And then I can go out and I can do side quests if I want to hunt for weapons and gear, or I can just start Heart of Stone and then like get gear from there and go into Blood of Wine. So that's exactly what I did. And I managed to wrap up Heart of Stone, which is about a 10 hour expansion. The story's a little bit less than that, but you do have a lot of side quests you unlock as well. And then make my way into the brand new world that you get with Blood and Wine, which is an entire, entirely new province called Toussaint, where it's sort of a uh, sort of fairy tale type stuff where there's knights of air and princesses and castles and stuff like that. It's a it's a huge jump from all of the other worlds you get to explore in The Witcher 3. And I can see why people speak so highly of it. I'm only about six hours into it. And I don't really want to talk about either of those expansions in extensive detail. I just want to talk about the expansions as a whole. And I think what they do for The Witcher 3 and why you should absolutely play them if you haven't. Because that's probably the coolest thing about playing these two expansions right now is that it's 2018 going on 2019. And, uh, you know, it's three years after The Witcher came out. So three years later and I'm playing basically brand new Witcher content. I'm playing a brand new game and I know it's summertime. The drought is upon us, right? Not a lot of games. Everyone's like, what's there to play? What's there to play? I'm constantly urging people to go into their backlog to look at old games and just revisit things they missed out on. We, we blow past games so quickly in a time when they age really well. And The Witcher 3 is an incredible looking game, especially if you play it on PC or like Xbox One X Enhanced, you can play with 60 FPS. It just runs incredibly well and it looks amazing even on base consoles. It is just so worth going back to if you haven't played it because it's a game that really isn't gonna age, to be honest. Like that world design, that execution, I think the only thing in The Witcher 3 that will ever age maybe poorly is going to be its combat because it's just not that deep. It's not really that enjoyable compared to how repetitive it tends to get, especially on easier difficulties. But the rest of the game, I think, is just going to age incredibly well. Three years is nothing. So to like sit here and to ignore this game because it's three years old would be, would be a very silly thing to do. So let's actually talk about how... Sede Prayek handles both of these expansions because this is the thing that impresses me the most. First and foremost, everything that you loved about The Witcher 3, if you played it, is there in Heart of Stone and Blood and Wine. I mean, this is more Geralt, right? This is more of your chance to take Geralt and tell the story of your Geralt. That's one of the things that that Red has been able to do so well with Geralt is that he has a bit of this is my Commander Shepard in him, but he also still is very much his own Geralt. There are certain things that Geralt will say that you maybe will be like, mm, I would have handled that a little bit differently because he's Geralt though. He's a Witcher, right? You just kind of decide the type of Witcher he is. And you get to do a lot of that at Heart and Stone in Blood and Wine. You get to make those decisions. You get to decide who lives or die. You get to continue to be your Geralt. And I think that's a really impressive demonstration of just the sort of pipeline, the streamlining that this team has for developing stories around Geralt as a character. There's one huge thing, though, that both of these DLCs do that really blew me away. I don't know if any of you have ever watched the show Supernatural. Sam and Dean Winchester, you know, starts off as a very simple, like, sort of low-key show, but amazing stuff. One of my favorite television series. And they're, they're hunters, man. They hunt demons. They hunt bad things, right? Well, the show continues to grow and explode, and it's still going today. 
And it reaches a certain point where they just realize if it's going to keep going, we just have to kind of make things crazy. And like God's going to come into the picture. The Leviathans were probably the last time that the show felt like it was in a place where I would say, okay, this all like works, makes sense, still feels grounded in like what the show originally was. That's not to say I don't like where the show is now. I think it's incredible they've been able to keep it going for this long. But a part of me is someone who grew up watching that show and listening to Loverboy and you know, Dean's and Paula roar off into the darkness at the end of every episode. That, for me, was like a certain mood, a certain feeling that I wanted them to capture and close out the show with. So I always felt Supernatural should have ended after the Leviathan stuff, roughly after that. Kind of close out with Sam and Dean getting in the Impala one more time, Loverboy rolling on the radio, and them driving off, accepting the fact that, hey, or maybe not fighting some big end of the world type thing again, but we're hunters and that's just, that's what our life is. You know, that acceptance of this is what we do and end the show knowing that like, no, all of the darkness, all of the evil hasn't been taken from this world, but that's Sam and Dean, there they go, back to hunting again, right? I always wanted to sort of come back to that. If they were gonna end the show, that's how I would have wanted to have seen it done. The Witcher 3 continues with Heart of Stone and Blood and Wine in that exact fashion. The idea of witchers and what they do. Geralt is a witcher. He hunts monsters. In fact, The Witcher 3 even ends in that way. <laughs> like, just, we're witchers. Here's what we do. I love that. I love that they don't try and ascend Geralt to some higher purpose other than I'm a witcher, I hunt monsters, and often that that does lead to me being brought into situations that maybe do feel a little bit beyond my pay grade, but hey, at the end of the day, I came here because this affected me as a witcher and my ability to hunt monsters, what I do. So Heart of Stone and Blood and Wine are based around contracts where Geralt is going to hunt a monster, but then they turn into so much more, and I love that. I, I love the way they handle that. It's it's freaking spectacular, and it does an amazing job of capturing that mood once again of you being Geralt. I think it's a great way to take the player out of the end of The Witcher 3, where they had all these relationships with characters, and to now put them back out on their own. Give them a chance to experience the game world as Geralt alone as a Witcher once again, without a lot of other sidekicks. I mean, he does meet characters who are friends who he has relationships that you can you know sort of develop with again but it feels again like he's out on his own doing his thing once again and that's just a great way to set up two really large expansions like this and both of them just tell unique fun and relatively original stories that you just want to sink your teeth into it's been a real joy to experience new witcher content here in 2018 so i really want to stress to you guys if you've been sitting on these two dlcs if you've been sitting on The Witcher 3, man, do yourself a favor. It's on sale all of the time. Like I mentioned with the two DLC, if you just feel like maybe your character's... Like, I don't even know what I was doing with my character. What level is my character? You can start a new Geralt that will take you right into Heart of Stone and then just kind of run with that from there. There are going to be some instances, like in Blood and Wine, where there's certain armor you might want to get for the Witcher gear sets where you'll have to go back and get the old Witcher gear sets in order to craft the new ones. But all in all, it's actually a pretty seamless experience, and I'm really impressed with how uh, with how CD Projekt handled that ability to let people just sort of play those two expansions as standalone and as a way to start a new character. It works out really well. It makes the game even easier to pick up here in 2018. All of the things you love about The Witcher 3, if you are a Witcher 3 fan, like the world design, the environments... That stuff gets blown out of the water in Blood and Wine. I really want to stress how impressive the new province of Toussaint is in Blood and Wine. It is a spectacular place, super Ansel screenshot worthy, and it's just a great place to be, man. I mean, like I said, you've got all these new characters, new gear to find, new quests to go on behind the main quest, lots of great side quests. Dare I say, too, with Blood and Wine, I'm about six and a half hours into it now. There are two side quests in particular I've done that I think really dwarf the scale of anything they did in the original game. Like these are two side quests where I was convinced I was playing the main story. That's how spectacularly they've been handled. I mean, Blood and Wine within itself could be an entire game for $60, but it's not. It comes in the expansion pass for like $30 with Hearts of Stone. So I'm gonna leave it at that. This has just been me really just glowing about how spectacular The Witcher 3 is once again and how impressive these two DLC are because that's simply the facts, ladies and gentlemen. Don't miss out on this completely amazing bit of RPG. The storytelling is incredible. The characters, you're just not going to want to stop playing this once you dive in. So do yourself a favor. And if you do play it, let me know what you think. Thank you guys so much for watching. 
I hope you have a great week. I'll see you guys on and off for content. Also going to be spending some time with my family for Independence Day, the 4th of July this Wednesday. But I will definitely see you for more Anthem and more other gaming goodness. Thank you so much for watching, and I'll see you in the next one. You have been brought here for a purpose. The most important task of your lives.